Hello, and welcome to Front and Center with me, your host, Patrice Charlotte, Communication Specialist for Equity and Community Health. I am a woman with dark hair. I am wearing a cream button down, and my background is blue with the MGH logo. As always, we encourage comments and questions, and we'll have a dedicated Q&A at the end of the presentation. We ask that you save your questions until the end and submit them by using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your window. Should you have comments, please feel free to put those in the chat. Live transcript is also available. To turn this feature on, please click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Today, we are talking about the MGH Disability Program, led by Zari Amir Husseini, MGH Disabilities Program Manager. The MGH Disability Program was created in 2010 in response to our patients with disabilities who described the ways in which they found the MGH to be inaccessible. As a result, MGH collaborated with Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Boston Center for Independent Living to identify priorities and strategies to improve the experience for those with disabilities. Over the last 12 years, more automatic door openers and lifts have been installed on campus, high adjustable exam tables have been purchased, and bathrooms have been updated to become ADA compliant. Our disability program has hosted panel discussions, speakers, educational sessions, and town halls focused on a range of disability topics. And information has been posted to the website for patients with disabilities and their families, as well as their Apollo site to provide resources to staff. In 2020, the MGH Disability Program became part of Equity and Community Health, facilitating closer coordination with equity and inclusion efforts across the hospital. In 2021, the program expanded to include Karen Turner, the MGH Patient Navigator for Autism and Developmental Disorders. Karen leads the Healthcare Inclusion Program for Developmental Disabilities, which includes support for more than 100 MGH champions for autism from a variety of roles across the hospital. In addition to their work at MGH, Zari and Karen participate in local and national organizations, such as the City of Boston Mayor's Disability Commission, the Autism Research Institute, and the Disability Equity Collaborative. And now it is my pleasure to pass it off to today's presenters. Thank you so much, Patrice. Sorry and I are so excited to be here today to share with you about disability identity. This slide is titled Disability as Identity. It displays a collage of photographs of individuals with disabilities, families, advocates, and staff. Disability identity is a sense of self that includes one's disability and feelings of connection to or solidarity with a disability community. This slide is titled, Disability is Intersectional. It includes text and infographics highlighting disability prevalence among racial, ethnic, and LGBTQ groups. Disability is intersectional with all other forms of identity and is also highly prevalent. One in four adults identify with having a disability. Disability prevalence is also higher among some groups. For example, 40% of bisexual men and of transgender adults have a disability, and 30% of American Indian and Alaska Native individuals have a disability. This slide is titled Disability Disparities in Healthcare Cancer Screenings. It includes a chart with bar graphs and text describing disparities related to cancer screenings. Significant differences are noted in yellow. Individuals with disabilities experience disparities in accessing healthcare. One example is cancer screenings. In 2021, MGH patients with disabilities had significantly lower rates of breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screenings compared to patients without disabilities. This disparity has also been noted in national studies. Now I'll turn to Zari to share a little bit more about disability identity. Thank you, Karen. My name is Zaria Mehrhaseni. I'm the Disability Program Manager. I'm a woman with a pink shirt and a background with blue uh, logo, MGB logo. So the slide you're looking at is titled People First versus Identity First Language. This slide uh, illustrates a smiling young girl holding an infinity symbol for neurodiversity in her left hand. The illustration shows 
the smiling girl standing in front of it. Um, the other illustration shows the smiling girl standing in front of an uh, infinity neurodiversity sign with her arms outstretched. While there is no single correct vocabulary surrounding disability, two common philosophies tend to be most prevalent. Person-first language stems from the idea that we are all people first and foremost, regardless of disability or other aspects of our identity. Common phrases that align with this philosophy include, I'm a person with a disability, I'm a person who has a disability, I'm a person with lived experience with a disability. The key here is that disability is secondary to the person. Identity first language embodies the idea that disability is integral to person's identity, that we cannot separate disability from self. Common phrases that align with this philosophy include, I am disabled, I'm autistic, I'm deaf, I'm an amputee, or I'm, in a, wheel, I'm a wheelchair user. It's important to respect and acknowledge a person's preferred vocabulary and no two people identify themselves in the same way. The next slide that we are looking at is titled, How We Identify Ourselves. I think of disability as uh, disability identity as very fluid. I am a person with a disability. And it's really dependent on the individual's um, perspective and when they're, where they are in their journey. One identity is through a lens of disability pride, a positive sense of self, feeling of connection to and solidarity with the disability community. The images that you're looking at on the left are of the Capitol Crawl protest on March 12, 1990. I was actually there. This was a time when thousands of people with disabilities came together to protest for disability rights to end discrimination and around housing, transportation, and employment. This was of course a critical event leading to the passage of Americans with Disabilities Act. Although some people embrace their disability as an aspect of their personal identity and feel connected to a specific community, others may not. One woman illustrated her experience with a disability with an image of a tomato and with this description, I have a disability but I don't think of myself as disabled, just like a tomato that's technically a fruit, and yet it feels like a vegetable. The next slide that we are looking at is titled, Flexibility is the Key. It has one photograph of a young man uh, in three positions, sitting in a wheelchair, standing using love strand crutches and standing without assistive device. The image is a visual representation of how the experience of disability can fluctuate. For example, wheelchair users may be able to walk short distances or may even be able to walk without a wheelchair on some days. Autistic individuals may use headphones to enjoy listening to loud heavy metal and yet uh, react differently to loud or sudden noises in, a, in certain environments, such as medical alarms. And that may feel painful to them. Also keep in mind that visible disability doesn't mean that the individual itself identifies exclusively that way. For example, Someone may identify as a deaf individual who also uses a wheelchair. This individual identifies as deaf, but does not consider their physical disability as a part of their personal identity. The key is to be flexible and not to make assumptions. 
Next, I'm going to turn it into turn it to Karen. Thank you, Zari. <laughs> Thank you. This slide is titled "Talking About Disability Is Easier Than You Think: How to Start the Conversation." During the next several minutes, uh, Zari and I will present two vignettes. In the first vignette, you'll see an interaction between a patient with a disability and their physician. In the second vignette, you'll see an interaction between an employee with a disability disclosing their disability for the first time to their manager in order to request accommodations. We hope you will, uh, we hope these will help you to be able to apply these tips across a variety of social situations. So Zari and I have chosen to do a role play together. And so I'll begin. Our first vignette, as I said, is between a patient and their healthcare provider. I'll be the provider and we'll be meeting um, Sari for the first time. I've also just learned about the updated disability identity flag in Epic that rolled out two weeks ago. Imagine that this patient arrives in a wheelchair. I open the medical record and note the disability identity has not been captured. How would I start the conversation? Here's a possible example of how. Hi, Zari. Before we begin today, I'd like to go over some of your personal information so that we have everything updated in your record. I'm going to ask you a few questions. You know, we have a disability flag that captures a patient's disability as a demographic, and I don't see it on your record. However, I see that you're using a wheelchair. Do you consider yourself a person with a disability? Yes, I use a wheelchair. I have a physical disability, but I also have other disabilities. Okay, would you like me to document your disability in the medical record? Sure, why not? Okay, sounds great. Um, I have several options here. Would you like me to read them to you or would it be more helpful for you to look at the screen with me and we can read them through together? No, you can read them to me. Okay, that sounds good. Here's the options. I'm gonna go one by one so that um, you can let me know if you identify with that one or not. The first is autism spectrum or neurodivergent? No. Okay. Blind or low vision? No. Cognitive or learning? No. Deaf or hard of hearing? No. Mental health? Yes. Physical mobility? Yes. Speech or communication? No. There's also an option that you can choose where you can say, yes, I have a disability, but I prefer not to provide details around my disability. Would you rather me choose that one? No, I think I'm all set. Okay. And there's also an other category where I can write in more about how you prefer to be identified. Is there anything else that you'd like me to write there? No. Okay. So I've selected mental health and physical mobility. There's also a comment field where I can document assistance or accommodations that you might need during your visits here. Are there any accommodations that you can think of that you'd like me to include? Um, yes, I'll need a lift to transfer onto exam tables during my appointments. Um, and it would also help if I could be in a very quiet room and also deal with one um, provider at a time. Okay, I wrote those here. Um, so now we have it documented in your record so we can be more aware of your needs when you schedule appointments and come in. Do you have any questions about that? No, that sounds fine. Actually, I think it's pretty cool that you're collecting disability data. That's great. Thanks. <laughs> Well, and thank you also for sharing with me about your disability. Um, you know, and while we're talking about disability, how is your experience with coming to this clinic? You know, is there anything that we could improve to support you here? Hmm. Well, yeah, actually, in your waiting area, I've noticed that there is no open or designated area for people who arrive in wheelchairs. Would it be possible to just open an area so when people arrive, they feel more comfortable. You know, thanks so much. I had actually never realized that and hadn't thought of that. I'd be happy to bring the suggestion to our team here. Thanks so much for pointing that out. Yeah, so now, thank you. 
So now I'm going to share my screen again. And we're just going to go over a few key takeaways from this. So this slide is titled Takeaways. And the first one is even if someone's disability is apparent, such as um, you know, uses a white cane or uses a wheelchair, they may not identify as a person with that disability. In this case, the patient did identify with their physical disability, um, but also identified with a non-apparent disability and requested accommodations for that uh, specific to that disability as well. The key is just to always ask before documenting. The second point that we wanted to share with you is how leading with the benefits of, dis benefits of disclosing disability um, can be very helpful for having the conversation and for opening the conversation. Um, so for example, it might be um, sharing how we're looking to capture patient demographics better, how this is one way that we can work to provide care, and also um, one way that we can then provide accommodations specific to the person. Please know also that um, at least 95% of patients are comfortable disclosing their disability um, and information about their disability to healthcare providers. This, is, um, this high prevalence is supported both by an internal MGB survey that was done last year, as well as national studies. So now I'm going to turn it over to Zari for our next vignette. Oh, sorry, you're on mute. Thank you, Karen. So um, we are now going to do Minia 2, uh, titled Employee with Disability Manager Encounter. Um, this second vignette is between an employee and a non uh, employee with a non-apparent disability and her supervisor. I will be the supervisor and Karen will be the employee with a disability. The employee meets the supervisor somewhat distressed and uncomfortable since she has not talked about her disability until now. Then Zaria and Karen, um, we will, then Karen and I will be um, presenting the vignette. So I'll start. Stop sharing this. My apologies, I just learned the That's slides okay. weren't displaying it correctly. So um, our second, um, hi Zari, thank you for meeting with me today. Of course, what's going on? Well, this is a bit personal, but I have MS, multiple sclerosis, and lately I've been having more flare-ups. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yes, and when I have flare-ups, I experience more fatigue and brain fog, and the shifts that I'm on makes it hard for me to um, regulate my sleep enough and also to get in, um, to take my medications on time. Oh, that sounds really difficult. Um, thanks, it is. And while I'm, I'm just really concerned that if I'm tired and I'm having difficulty concentrating, it may affect um, when I'm working with my patients, especially when keeping track of medications. Well, uh, that's a great concern, especially if, if, if in fact, it impact, impacts patient safety. Thanks so much. You know, it hasn't um, impacted safety yet. It hasn't become an issue, but I'm just concerned that it could become one, which is why I wanted to talk to you today and figure out a solution. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing this with me. Um, one idea that comes to my mind is perhaps if you want to take a medical leave and get the treatment you need and come back when you feel better. You know, would you consider other options? Um, what are your ideas? I was thinking maybe like a more regular shift, like a regular day shift. Hmm. Uh, well, uh, let me think about that. I'm not sure if I can arrange that, but uh, let me. Uh, consult with HR and get back to you by tomorrow. Is that okay? Sure, that sounds great. Thank you. So now it's tomorrow. 
And um, hi, Karen. I wanted to update you. I've been consulting with HR, and they suggested a few things rather than taking a medical leave. Uh, they suggested the more regular schedule um, that would be an option for accommodations, along with some rest periods. Unfortunately, the day shift is not available but right now, but I can offer a night shift from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. and uh, put in some um, coverage so you can have some rest periods in between that time, during that time. So how does that sound? That sounds great. Really, anything just to have a more regular schedule. Great. Um, so why don't you try the new schedule and let's, um, let's set up a time um, maybe in a week to come back together and see how the new schedule is working for you. But meanwhile, if you have any concern or if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to let me know. Of course I will. You know, I was really nervous to talk to you about this, but I feel so much better. And I appreciate the efforts um, that you've been, you've, you're have you making to help accommodate me. Of course, I appreciate you coming to me. And so some of the takeaway during these conversations include um, making sure that the discussion of disability um, from the employee might be difficult, um, especially if the employee has never brought it up before. Common reasons why employees don't bring up the issue of requesting accommodations or even talking about their disability might be that they might lose their job or the issue of stigma or being treated differently or uh, even feeling of isolation from their colleagues. Also, keep in mind that um, you need to make sure that you're open, that you listen and express gratitude and support when someone self-discloses. Asking employees about possible accommodation is empowering. And finally, review requested accommodations with HR to determine feasibility and set up a reasonable time to connect with the employee. So in summary, organizations are at their best when they welcome, respect, and include people of all backgrounds. This includes people with disabilities. Disability identity is personal, intersectional, and fluid based on social and environmental factors. Always ask how someone identifies and their preference for, per for terminology. Acknowledging that it's important for you to understand a per person's preference can also help open the discussion. Recognize that disability includes individuals who identify with a specific disability, such as mobility. Identify with a specific community, such as deaf or autistic or a condition such as mental health. Problems are best solved by working with people who have experienced firsthand and know, ex uh, know the solutions that work the best for them. Just like issues that impact people of different racial, ethnic, or other backgrounds, people with disabilities should be involved in solving issues that impact them. The more you talk about disability, the more comfortable you will become. And it's okay to make a mistake. The most important thing is to try. And that finally, talking about disability is easier than you think. These are, uh, the slide is titled resources. Um, and it just displays some text with several resources here. One is our Apollo Accessibility Resource site, which is a really rich site we recommend that you check out. And then there's um, some key resources here specifically for employees and managers that just launched this year that a large group went into creating too. So we recommend you check those out if that applies in your situation too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Zari and Karen. I would like to now open up the Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have questions, please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to submit them. We did receive a few questions beforehand, so I am going to ask the first one. Um, Zari, Karen, is it okay to use the word impairment when talking about disability? 
Well, although many people with disabilities may be comfortable with the word impairment, it's important to consider that in you implying when using this word within the healthcare, people with disabilities are often viewed as needing to be cured or fixed. However, this view is outdated and offensive to people with disabilities. Uh, instead, it's important to shift our thinking and consider how people um, experience barriers due to inaccessible social structure. Some examples of inaccessible, um, some examples might be inaccessible buildings, um, inaccessible medical equipment or transportation, few sign language interpreters, lack of resources to ensure uh, equitable access or information that is difficult to read or understand. Instead of impairment, consider a um, consider using a more updated language. Um, the word, consider the word difference. Um, and then explore how to change barriers in creating um, the pro in solving the problem. Thank you, Zari. Um, so we just received a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there an employee resource group for people with disability? An ERG for folks with disabilities? Yes. yes, there is a, there was a EDRG employee disability resource group at Mass General. Um, however, now we are working on a system-wide MGBERG because we are finding that um, there, is a, there is a bigger community out there and it, we are stronger together. So we are hoping to put together uh, the MGBERG uh, soon. So we'll let everyone know as soon as it's up and running. Awesome. Okay, so stay tuned. We received another question. In job applications, there is a question to disclose about disability in the last part. How will this impact the recruitment process? I think that again, it's up to the individual and where they are in their journey. Uh, if, for example, you feel comfortable disclosing your disability, um, you should. But I always tell people to think about why it is that they want to share their disability, whether they want to share it because they might need accommodations or whether they just want to let people know ahead of time. Um, but I think that it's really individual, the individual's decision. I personally tell people that, you know, um, unless you need accommodations, you don't have to disclose, um, but that's my personal preference. Thank you, Zari. Um, and we have another question from the audience. If a patient is uncomfortable sharing private information at the front desk, can they update the disability flags in their record through Gateway themselves? And if so, are there limitations? Can we take this one? So, um, you know, I'm thrilled that you're asking this question. So, um, currently, there is no option to share about your disability and accommodations that you need in Patient Gateway. However, Zari and I are working with the, on this specifically with the large group across MGB so that there will be something in the future. Um, we're hoping that that work will come out in like the next year or so. And um, it will most likely be, um, at least initially, in the form of a questionnaire that one of your providers could then assign to you for you to be able to fill out and complete. Um, and we do hope eventually to have it built more formally into EPIC within demographics. And it's something that Zari and I are actually also part of a national group working on uh, making those recommendations to EPIC as well. Um, the um, so right now your options are to disclose either to hospital registration. So you can call, ask to update your record um, and share your disability and accommodations information. You can do so at the front desk. You can also do with any um, clinical person, a nurse, a physician, myself, Zari, um, you know, um, we all have access to the, um, 
the flag and could update it for you. Um, but we can't wait until individuals will be empowered to enter their own information. Awesome. So lots to come, lots on the horizon, lots of really great work. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of our time today. So I would like to again say thank you to Zari and Karen for such an important discussion. To remain connected, please do connect with uh, Zari and Karen on their Apollo page, apollo.massgeneral.org slash accessibility for more information and our panelists' contact information. So as I said, that concludes this month's Front and Centered. October is Disability Awareness Month, and we hope that you can utilize the best practices from today's webinar to inform your work. Next month, we will not have our regularly scheduled front and centered. Instead, Joe Betancourt, Senior Vice President of Equity and Community Health, will be presenting the year-to-date review on October 13th at noon. So join us when we return in November, where the work of our youth programs will be featured. Stay tuned for more information and look for updates on our Apollo page. We do hope that you join us. And in the meantime, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Take care, everyone.